Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us today in our second seminar uh, of a series navigating academic waters. And like Julia said, it's put together by AGU H3S, the student subcommittee, and Quasi. And on behalf of uh, myself, the development team, my co lead Tom, uh, Tom Glos, and Layla and Julia, who's not joining us today, but uh, we all want to thank you for tuning in. So this month's webinar uh, will be, or we are excited to have uh, Dr. Sam Zipper, Dr. Crystal Jones, and Dr. Ger Gerald Bay Bales, it's my bad, um, to discuss data. So particularly, we're, looking, we're gonna be talking about the ethics of data management and sharing, uh, generating reproducible science, and we'll finish off by uh, talking about Quasi's HydroShare platform to share data, code, and models. So before the, we start the presentations, I'm just going to turn to the panelists and get them to introduce themselves, and we'll start off um, by, by introducing Sam. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Sam Zipper. I am a scientist at the Kansas Geological Survey, which is a research and service division of the University of Kansas, um, and I am mostly a eco-hydrologist, um, so I use a variety of publicly available um, secondary water data, um, including but not limited to USGS streamflow data, um, groundwater level data, land use land cover data, um, remote sensing data, all sorts of things. So I call it an integral part of my day to day life. Um, all right. Hey everyone, my name is Crystal Jones. I am currently a research affiliate at SUSINC, the National Socio Environmental Synthesis Center. Um, I was there full time as a research scientist for several years um, and now spend most of my time working as a private consultant, but I still do some work at SUSINC. Um, my background, my PhD is in rural sociology, so I'm coming at things um, at least disciplinarily from the social sciences um, and kind of thinking about the social dimensions of natural resource management broadly. Um, and so much of my own research work has been gathering primary data, um, and I have deposited that data in, um, in repositories, um, kind of so working in the open science frame as a data creator or generator. Um, but at Succinct, I've spent a lot of time um, kind of providing technical assistance and building capacity uh, for the reuse of data or the use of secondary data. And that's mostly what I'll be talking about today. Hi, I'm Jared Bales. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm the executive director of Kawasi. I've been at Kawasi since uh, January 2017. So at Kawasi, we uh, work uh, to make data more uh, accessible, uh, fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Prior to that, I spent most of my career at the U.S. Geological Survey, first working at a water science center in North Carolina, uh, collecting data. And uh, then I was in headquarters for seven years, guiding um, more policy and research uh, direction. So happy to be here. So thank you all uh, for introducing yourselves. So just to kind of reiterate what Julia said at the beginning, we will be looking at the Q&A box or the question box uh, throughout the seminar. So if the audience has any questions, please feel free to post there. Um, we do have a 10 minute Q&A session at the end of all the presentations. Um, so then that's your chance to kind of ask the panelists or anyone uh, questions about what they're talking about. And so with that, I will pass the spotlight on to uh, Dr. Sam Zipper and he'll be discussing uh, how the, the ethics behind sharing open source data and also how to effectively use it. Cool, so can everyone see my screen at this point? Awesome, um, well, thanks everybody. Um, I'll take this brief uh, opportunity to kind of share um, first, just some, some insights into how kind of I use um, open data as part of a broader uh, reproducible workflow um, that I that I try to adopt for my research projects and kind of get into some some thinking that I've been doing with a bunch of other um, people about kind of the ethics of um, data sharing as we get in to uh, more and more the realm of socio hydrology and socio environmental science where humans are becoming part of the water cycle um, more uh, kind of explicitly. So 
Um, I would start off with just kind of um, uh, a motivating uh, slide here of why I find it valuable to use a reproducible workflow. Um, and the main value that I see is actually to myself, um, like most human beings, I'm inherently a selfish person. Um, so I do things that make my life easier. Um, and the main uh, reason that I kind of find reproducible workflows really valuable is that it make it easier for me in the future, um, particularly when I'm getting, you know, revisions on a paper and I have to redo some analysis or something like that. Very kind of instantaneous for me to pop back into my workflow, get the exact data and the exact point that I need um, and run whatever I need to do immediately. Um, and I, um, open data and kind of data sharing is, is integral to that process. Um, so I thought I would start with just three short principles for a reproducible workflow. I'm kind of sourced from uh, past me, dumpster, fi dumpster fire version of me to um, present me, um, life on the beach version of me. Um, so three principles that, that I believe have really kind of worked effectively for me um, are having one directory per project, all paths relative to that uh, project root directory, and then having task size scripts with intuitive file names. Um, so I'll start with each of these with a negative example from my past and then um, a positive or I would say kind of work in progress example um, for my present. Um, and I would really emphasize that this is always a work in progress. Um, so this is kind of an example from my dissertation research. As you can see, I've got kind of a confusing jumble of uh, files mixing uh, Excel files, MATLAB files, R scripts, CSV files, et cetera, um, all in kind of one, uh, one directory. Um, where I think it's kind of really valuable to go is having a nice mixture of, um, you know, uh, organized subdirectory for each project where you're um, saying, here's my data, here's my results, here's my code, or I, I could put it in the source folder and then a clearly laid out readme. Um, so that is, I would say, kind of principle one. Um, and that allows you to really easily kind of port your data directly into a, a single repository where you know it's always gonna be. Um, second, then in using that, um, you'd want to have all of your paths relative to that project directory. Um, so you uh, would want to avoid anything where you're setting a working directory in your analysis. This is a snippet of R code. Um, and the reason for having all of those paths relative to that root directory is then when you share your data through HydroShare or some other platform, um, people don't have to kind of go in and change all of the paths in your code. Um, they can just load it onto their computer. Um, as long as they're starting in the root directory, the script will know kind of exactly where within that root directory to look. Um, and then third, to just kind of split up your, your workflow into task size scripts that have intuitive file names. Um, so here is my past where I had a bunch of uh, scripts that all kind of look like they're doing basically the same thing, um, if you look at them. And then present where there's kind of very uh, clearly laid out workflow um, from script one to script two to script three, um, stating kind of what each one of those things do. Um, so that is what I would kind of call the, the motivation behind uh, my re reproducible workflow, which as I mentioned earlier, is kind of always improving. Um, and um, yeah, kind of the main uh, personal value that I see in the open science movement is actually just because it makes my life easier. Um, and it's kind of an added benefit that uh, it allows my data to be used by others as well. Um, so kind of the other piece I wanted to talk about is the, is the ethics um, piece of it. So we're kind of um, on an interesting place as a hydrological community where there's a, a growing acknowledgement that, that humans are an explicit part of the water cycle. Um, this is kind of illuminated through, um, you know, centers like the Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center, um, which isn't specifically about water, um, but water is, is a focus there. Um, and you know the socio-hydrology um, kind of emerging discipline. Um, it's a longstanding, um, you know, human water relationships have been a longstanding part of the geography curriculum, et cetera. Um, but as we're kind of getting into this era of big data, open science, and socio-environmental research, there's kind of a, a I wouldn't say a, a problem, but there's a risk of kind of inadvertent violation of the privacy of individuals through the sharing of data. Um, 
And the reason that there is this risk um, is at least in my background, and I think in the background of most people I've talked to, water scientists don't really have training in data ethics. Um, at least that wasn't part of my PhD program. Um, so what I was gonna, what I wanted to do is just kind of highlight three quick snapshots of types of data where there could potentially be a privacy risk. Um, and the reason that I'm kind of doing this part of my talk second, just I wanted in the first part to really emphasize that I am totally in support of open data. Um, and I just want people to keep in mind that they should be aware um, when working in these kind of socio environmental systems that there are risks that emerge. Um, so don't just post everything blindly, but always stop and take a minute to think. Um, so three kind of examples that, that uh, myself and my co-authors came up with in, in a paper that we recently published um, is high resolution spatial data. Um, that would be, for example, high resolution remote sensing or something like that, particularly you know, in an urban setting. Um, consumer data, um, this, you know, the growing kind of field of smart meter based research um, from water utilities perspective. Um, you can, using these data, you know, very, um, uh, directly kind of deconvolute someone's presence or absence in a house and what sort of activities they may be doing. Um, and then digital trace data, and that would be um, data like using social media posts or something like that to um, study environmental problems. Um, for example, um, I've used social media, Twitter data to look at crop planting dates. Um, so kind of each of these three categories has some risk. Um, and I put this up because we made a really complicated flowchart, um, so I don't want everyone to read that. But what I wanted to highlight are the two most important questions you should ask yourself. Um, the first question you should ask yourself before kind of deciding to share your data is could someone connect my data points to individuals either by just my data alone or by combining it with other data sources? And that's really the important part um, is that we have to think of our data that we collect and distribute as part of a rich data ecosystem. Um, so, um, we've all heard about, you know, Facebook kind of scraping tools from, from uh, information from various other websites. Um, similarly, our data is kind of tapped into that data ecosystem. And second, and this is really the hard question I've found to answer in my experience, um, is could those individuals reasonably expect that surveillance is taking place? Um, those are kind of the two fundamental questions that it comes down to um, when you're deciding whether there may be a potential privacy risk associated with sharing your data. Um, and usually, um, in my experience, my answers are something along the lines of maybe, I don't really know. I mean, that's why it's really valuable for hydrologists um, and water scientists like us who don't really have training in these things to talk to people. Um, so that would include the potentially affected parties and communities. Um, it would also include um, resources you may have at your university or institution, such as institutional review boards, um, research librarians, social scientists who have more experience working with these sorts of things, um, just as kind of, uh, you know, a resource. Um, so with that, I will, um, yeah, kind of conclude there. I have some, some links in here to kind of um, provide some more resources, including the paper. Um, I think these slides were pasted into the chat, um, so feel free to download them and, and look at them, and I will, uh, Hand it off to the next person. Thank you, Sam. That my computer's liking. Um, thank you, Sam. That was a really interesting conversation uh, or a presentation, and I hope it does lead to some interesting questions. I do know that I've seen a few uh, people post questions already, so um, we'll get to that later in the Q and A session. So to keep things moving along, next we have uh, Dr. Crystal Jones. And she'll be talking about um, the challenges with using secondary data. Great, thanks. Um, I don't have slides, so hopefully everyone can see and hear me and we'll be good. Um, I do just wanna say jumping off of Sam's presentation, although this is not where I was planning to start mine, um, but one of the things I have thought a lot about as a social scientist um, and thinking about the sort of strengths social scientists bring to thinking about confidentiality and ethics issues, but also the um, lack of familiarity that many of us have with open data. It's actually much less common, I would say, across all the social sciences broadly as a paradigm or as a space that people are working in. Um, I really, I think some of the points that Sam made about um, documentation and reproducible workflows actually can 
help us address some of these ethical concerns. Um, it helps us work through exactly what's in the data and how it could be used with other data sources. Um, and I also think documentation can address some of the ethical issues, maybe not so specifically with personal identification, but with representation um, and with kind of how data might be reused and whether that's an appropriate reuse based on the content itself. Um, so anyway, I just, I think documentation might be a consistent theme here. Um, and I certainly see it as being one that can address the ethics issues and in, in addition to kind of the practical workflow issues. Um, and that's actually, I guess, kind of where I, where I was intending to start today. Um, so I, like I said, I um, worked several years as a um, full-time as a research scientist at SUSINC. SUSINC is an NSF-funded synthesis center based at the University of Maryland. Um, I'm guessing many of you are maybe familiar with SUSINC or with NSTIS, which is the uh, National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, um, but it's sort of largely focused on ecological and biophysical sciences. Um, but the basic definition of a synthesis center, according to the NSF, is that it's a place entirely oriented around using secondary data or already existing information to ask new questions. Um, and generally, those, those new questions are um, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary. Uh, and so a big part of what I've spent the last few years doing at Sync is, is working with um, individuals, but mostly groups of teams of researchers who, who want to do this in the socio-environmental space. So, you know, working across disciplines and asking questions that are inherently crossing the human environment boundaries or, or, or you know, in, encompass the human environment sides of a given problem, a given location, whatever. Um, and so there are clearly a lot of ethics issues. There's also a lot of practical issues there. And I think it's kind of the practical ones I'll mostly focus on today. Um, or at least in this this part of this conversation, um, you know, a lot of what um, I have seen in working with teams of researchers is that it's it's often the case that it's very hard to move from ideas and research questions to actually finding data that can help answer those questions. Right. So it's a big challenge to have a have a big idea and start to operationalize it and realize, oh, the data is actually not accessible, right? Maybe it exists, but you can't access it, or you can actually can't find it at all, right? So maybe whether it, whether it does exist or not, it's not following the FAIR principles. Um, but there's also a lot of challenges with what's actually measured in a data set or in a set of data sets. And are those measurements what you thought they were? Do they reflect the concepts that are of interest, you know, based on your big idea, um, based on your research questions? Uh, and then are those measurements commensurate, right? So there's all of these challenges with working across multiple data sets and especially when we're adding multiple disciplines or thinking about kind of multiple dimensions of a problem. And one of the challenges we've seen at Sync in, in supporting people who wanna work, you know, ask new questions with existing information with secondary data is that the kind of classic scientific method that I think many of us, whether we're biophysical scientists or social scientists that we were trained in, um, to go from question to identifying appropriate data gathering methods and then data analysis methods. That linear process doesn't work as well if you're um, constrained, so to speak, by the kind of galaxy of secondary data that's already out there, right? And so there's much more of an iterative process that we've seen and that we've been working to support in a variety of ways. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's this sort of back and forth from ideas to data, back to refining your ideas, back to what data you might want to use, and eventually iteration on data and analytical methods, right? And um, one of the things that we realize is that it's often, even if, the, if data sources follow the FAIR principles, let's say, they're out there in kind of the open data universe, um, there's still not, it still might be difficult for researchers to really quickly gather the information they need to go through that iterative process, process to know what's available and exactly what the measurements are, what, the, and what many of the metadata characteristics are. So one of the things we've been working on at Sync is a project called the Data to Motivate Synthesis Project, um, which doesn't have a neat and clean publication. So I didn't share a publication, but it is on the Sync website if folks are interested, and I can throw that in the chat at the end. Um, but basically what we've been trying to think about over the last several years is really what do people, what do researchers need throughout this kind of iterative process of using secondary data? What information do they need to think about how to, to do that data integration? Um, and where we've come to is feeling like there's a, there's a 
an opportunity to really build out and utilize metadata. So before we even get to <laughs> what's in the flat file or the spreadsheet, we just want to understand kind of at the meta level what's in there. And so we developed this project, which again, I won't go into the details, but um, you know, it's a sort of, it's drawing on multiple approaches to organizing metadata um, using data ontologies, using various kinds of search functionality to help interdisciplinary teams assess what's in a data source or a data set and how that one data set might be used across um, in conjunction with many other data sets and then in a kind of interdisciplinary research project. Um, so as I was reflecting on this um, webinar and this topic and kind of thinking, okay, well, so what have I learned in, in kind of working on the Data to Motivate Synthesis project for the last several years, and, and I've learned lots of things, um, but sort of what have I learned that might be useful, right, to early career scientists or really anyone who's interested in um, both creating, generating data that might be put out there for eventual reuse, but also um, engaging in research that uses secondary or already existing data. Um, so a few lessons, um, and I think they kind of nicely complement some of what Sam talked about in terms of a reproducible workflow, again, kind of thinking more about if it is secondary data. Um, so if we think about the FAIR principles, you know, findability, which actually on the surface to me always seems like, well, it's either findable or it's not, but that's not actually, <laughs> it's a little more, um, there's a little more gray than that. Um, so a nice example for this project, this Data to Motivate Synthesis project is that we started it in the previous presidential administration. Um, and within our system, within our kind of catalog of data sets, we link to the, to the, to federal agency URLs, sources of, you know, data set, places where you can download data, right? Um, and over the last couple of years, we have realized um, with the shift in administration and kind of changes in what information is made public or not, that we actually became a bit of a refuge for some data sets. So there were these efforts, right, to create refuges for data that people were worried about not having access to. Um, and we inadvertently became one of those, uh, which was just sort of an interesting thing to observe, that actually those URLs were not persistent and the data sets themselves were not persistent in the findable, open, public domain. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's uh, helpful to think about the nuts and bolts of things like persistent URLs and also some of these more philosophical questions about where data live long term and what does that mean for findability. There's clearly strengths of using kind of public government oriented systems. There are also some potential weaknesses or limitations, um, you know, to depositing or, or relying on data that exists solely in the public domain. Um, and I think, you know, again, we can talk about this more in the Q&A, but um, so the second thing that, that we've thought a lot about um, is accessibility. Again, sort of machine readability is, is um, I would say at this point, again, kind of this, the floor, if you're, if you're working in the open data space, right, you want the files to be as readable and across sort of platforms as possible. Um, but one of the things that um, I've been thinking a lot about is also standardized documentation and that that's, a, that's an aspect of accessibility um, that again fits into a reproducible workflow uh, but, and might also include documentation that you don't need for your own workflow but that is really important if you are going to deposit data for somebody else to use down the line. So my kind of, I guess, observation as a researcher is that if I'm creating, if I'm generating data, I hope to share and, and have reused in the future. I want to make sure that I'm that I'm documenting kind of both the structure of the data to make sure it's as accessible as possible to a wide range of future users. And if I'm reusing it, I want to make sure I'm reading all of that documentation to make sure that I'm that uh, I'm understanding exactly what is sort of appropriate and not appropriate use. And so this is again where I think documentation starts to address some of the ethical concerns around reuse and, and appropriate reuse of information. Um, and when we think about interoperability, um, again, for this project at Succinct, we've largely been thinking about metadata standards. And I would say over the last five or so years of working in this space, there's been a lot of movement toward increasing standardization of those metadata standards, um, which is, I think, an exciting and important move so that um, it is more likely the case that you can really pull in not only the data themselves, but the metadata and, and look at those metadata across multiple data sources. Uh, but there's still some challenges um, with metadata standards and how that might render, at least at the outset, render the data inter easily interoperable or not. Um, so again, I think it's important to be keeping adequate records. I also think um, identifying repositories and, and locations for um, depositing data, if that's what you're doing, that are kind of 
discipline specific or discipline appropriate. Um, so for example, there's a lot of, I've done also done some work on how to deposit and reuse qualitative data, which largely comes from the social sciences and think starting to work across qualitative and quantitative metadata standards to make sure that we're using the same language for the same metadata category so that it, people really can assess, you know, nuts and bolts wise, is this interoperable, but also conceptually, can these various types of data be used together? Um, so I think, you know, thinking about a repository and sort of assessing repositories and locations for your data that, that can help you work through that, I think is really important and documenting as you go so that you have as robust a set of information as possible to then include in those in that metadata. Um, and then finally, the, this, this point about reusability, you know, and so and specifically attribution and making sure that that as data are reused throughout multiple types of processes that that all of that is um, Appropriately attributed and and, and appropriately done. Um, and so clearly many, many, or I think most repositories at this point publish data with some kind of persistent identifier, whether it's a DOI or some kind of like university generated persistent identifier, uh, which I think is sort of a lowest bar again, if you are a data depositor to make sure that's happening so that you're receiving appropriate attribution. Um, I've also seen a lot of folks again, more in the biophysical sciences and in the social sciences where I um, am coming from, uh, start to write data briefs or these data articles that are in peer-reviewed journals um, as another way to both put that information out in the world and kind of contribute across all of the FAIR principles and kind of, you know, build out the information associated with the data set, but it's also a way to, to ensure that if it's being reused, appropriate attribution is, is you know, is being made. Um, so those are just a couple of, I guess, yeah, observations and, and not exactly even recommendations, but you know, just sort of things I, I've been thinking about for myself as I continue to, to generate new data and want to put it out there into the open science or open data space. Um, but also that I've seen as I've been trying to pull in secondary data into this sort of system. And I think my, my sort of high level takeaway and, and summary point is really documentation all along the way is very, very important. And that's both if you're the depositor of primary data, if you're reusing secondary data, which often then can include redepositing some derived data set, um, you know, so reproducible workflows all along the way, as well as, and this is a little bit more as a social, uh, coming from a social science point of view, but really reflecting on the assumptions you're making all along the way about how the data can be used together, um, what's appropriate and not, and, and kind of conceptually, what do you see data that might already exist as, as measuring for your new research questions. So um, just being as self-reflective as possible throughout the research process, which I think is, again, a strength of social science that I think we can bring to the open science community and the open science conversation. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks so much. Thanks, Crystal. That, uh, a lot of the stuff you touched on actually is uh, things that we're gonna be kind of expanding on in the questions. I already know that we have some questions to um, kind of start kind of more getting into a little bit more specifics about what you, what you talked about, so that's exciting. Uh, so next, we're going to finish off with uh, Dr. Dar 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 Jared Bales. I'm sorry, I'm not sure why I'm stuttering over that. Um, and he will be introducing Hi to Share to us. So, thank you. Oh, thank you. Let me get set up here. Um, Okay, see my screen? Yep. Hi, Jared. We can see the presenter view right now, but on the top left, if you click swap displays, it should fix it. Yep. Thank you. Or, yeah. right, so, got it, right? <clears throat> so, I'll, you know, my uh, talk is a little different. Uh, it's really just to talk, to introduce you to a platform that, um, you might use to share data uh, with the platform is HydraShare. It's at HydraShare.org. Um, Quasi operates and maintains this particular tool. This is the front page for the for the tool. You have uh, 
uh, your resources or your data, you discover other people's data, you collaborate on, on around your data, you use apps to uh, work on your data. So um, a, uh, a tool that has a fair amount of power uh, for the community. I did want to kind of start with these uh, quotes. Um, all of them, or, or most of them, are from, two of them are from Water Sources Research, and one's from BAMS. But uh, the first quote basically says, hydrology is multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. And so this gets to the issue of, you know, compiling data sets. Uh, for us to do good water science. I mean, as Sam said, humans are a big part of the water cycle. Um, and so while uh, you may be working on one particular problem and collecting data on that problem, you may need data from other sources. Um, the next uh, quote is basically saying, hydrologists spend a lot of time debugging code instead of looking at their data. Um, so, you know, you have to be able to uh, build and apply uh, these various models or apps or sets of code. But then, um, as Hutton said, most computational hydrology is not reproducible, so is it really science? Um, have you ever picked up someone else's model and tried to make it run or try to reproduce their work? Um, it can be a challenge. So collaborative data analysis and publication is really what HydroShare is about. And this, this wheel or circle represents the whole data life cycle from creation, preparation, description with metadata, publication, and then you may seek to discover other data. Uh, you may do data analysis. So HydroShare is a web-based uh, repository. Um, that helps enable uh, hydrologists or anyone to kind of work through this data life cycle. The flexible meta metadata, HydroShare can take uh, data of any type. Uh, the user or the owner can control access. The data can be published with a DOI so that the data set can be cited if you want. Um, and you can also document workflows in HydroShare. Uh, which is, again, something that Sam mentioned, uh, but also certainly helps with reproducible science. So putting, uh, putting data to work requires fair data, which we all mentioned before, data are findable, accessible, um, which means they're also understandable uh, and from a trusted repository. Uh, they're interoperable, uh, they meet community standards, and they're reusable. Um, based on the information that's in the uh, data set. So the data workflow uh, in the HydroShare, you can create um, a digital instance of a data set or a model. Uh, you share it with colleagues, either privately or with everyone. You collaborate around the data uh, in HydroShare so that you, know, you have a data set or a model. Uh, there's a workspace in HydroShare to do that kind of collaboration. Describe the data with metadata, um, and then you share it, and if you wish, publish the data uh, so others can use it. And said HydroShare makes that easier. So within HydroShare, the data uh, can be discovered through this uh, interface, which is on the right side of the uh, slide. Uh, faceted browsing, so essentially you search for something uh, and then you can filter by the author or the contributor or the content um, or other filters. The filters are on the left side of the how to share page there. You search by keywords and time uh, and there's also um, a map interface which can be used to look for data in a specific location. But of course, you have to know that how to share exists to do that. Um, every, so a resource in, in HydroShare, data, a collection of data or collection of information is known as a resource. So a resource, for example, could just be one data set or a resource could be 
um, all of the data, I mean, like a folder uh, in essence. Um, but that's a resource. And so the resources, as I said before, can be private or public or published. Um, the resources can be accessed through this landing page. They can also be accessed through a REST web interface. Um, and then you can download the data as individual files out of a resource or as an archive, archive of the entire resource. Um, reusability cert or citation certainly helps reusability. Uh, and so, as I said, uh, you can publish data, essentially push a button and receive a DOI for your data set, and then the data set are citable. Um, you can also cite other data sets in, in uh, HydroShare. So that's essentially, you know, there's this uh, block there that how to cite this particular resource. So HydroShare builds that for you. You can also override that with your own uh, citation if you wish. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the override. And then you cite it in a paper. Uh, yep. And so the other thing that HydroShare does is it uh, exposes the data through schema.org metadata, which is a, a metadata schema uh, created by kind of big tech. Uh, but it makes data sets discoverable. And so um, one can go into this Google data set search and actually find data in HydroShare directly. Uh, so this increases findability and then, then the uh, adhering to the schema.org increases interoperability. And so um, this is just a search for Logan River uh, data in uh, Google, in Google data set search and turned a, a HydroShare resource. So interoperability is enhanced through the use of standards. So I mentioned schema.org. Um, we use um, our, our resource data model as, as a profile of open archives. Metadata follow the Dublin Core standard. Data are packaged and downloaded using the Bagot standard. Uh, HydroShare uses standard formats for uh, specific uh, file types, so we adhere to these various formats, for example. So, well, that gets us to kind of the F and the A and the I, but the R is, uh, you know, how do we reuse the data? And so HydroShare uh, has, uh, hosts a number of apps uh, that users can apply to operate on HydroShare data. Um, users can also build their own app if they want and, and host it in HydroShare. But for example, um, some of the apps that we host are a national water model data viewer app. Uh, we have uh, MATLAB online that is free, so you don't have to have a license to operate on uh, data using our MATLAB online tool. We have uh, Jupyter, uh, uh, Jupyter Hub, Jupyter Notebooks, Binder, uh, and we can also uh, access our one of these other data sets, the Hydrologic Information System, which is time series data specifically through these specific apps. So I think that covers uh, quickly the use of HydroShare uh, for sharing data. Um, and of course, we're always happy to talk to you or walk you through it or give you tutorials if you want to use these things. And again, it's at hydroshare.org. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jared. Um, okay, so now we're going to move on to our Q&A session. And again, I will just encourage the audience, if you have any questions or follow-up questions, just post it in the chat box. And um, my helpers in the background are going to send, send them to me as, uh, as they come. So we are, um, so the first question comes from Steve, uh, and he asks, hello, I've been, uh, I've been asked by funding agencies of a grant to publish, uh, to publish the published publicly available data without any modifications. 
um, like from the USGS or, or NOAA. The metadata structure makes it difficult to cite sources. Um, they agree that this would be plagiarism if it was in a manuscript, but feel like the data, that for data, the same ethics don't apply. Um, so are there rules of plagiarism in publishing a manuscript? Are the rules of pl plagiarism in publishing in a manuscript different from those publishing data? And I'll just go ahead and post that if um, to publicly so that in case you guys didn't get that, I will put that right there. Um, so I guess that's really a question for anyone if um, they feel like the, the rules are for publish for using data is similar to those um, when you're citing manuscript. Sounds like a crystal question to me. I mean, I think the same rule should apply. <laughs> uh, I feel like any metadata standard that doesn't provide a place to say, to cite the original provenance is probably not a very good metadata structure. Uh, you know, that someone's being asked to post data slash publish data somewhere specific because that fits the, the funding agency requirements or the, um, you know, article publication requirements. That makes sense to me, but uh, there are, there, are, there is a standardized system in place that I would say is generally accepted as ethical to make sure that the original provenance is clearly documented and that usually then it's just metadata that's actually posted, not the original data source. And you point people back to the original data source, but I don't know. So that's my, I think, quick reaction. Yeah. Okay, so um, moving on to the next one. Uh, this one's from Sarah. So for, for those who work with data that contain elements that are confidential due to ethics and or legal framework, um, including you know, monitoring stations where all the data available except for the precise location, how can we make our workflows, uh, workflow as repeatable and as transparent as possible without disclosing the confidential elements? Um, so I think Sam, you had uh, kind of answered this, but if you could- um, Yeah, ask, sure, I'd be happy to. Um... Kind of expand on that. I did put um, kind of a, a link to a paper in the chat box where we discussed this in a bit of detail. Um, but, you know, just to give an example from my own personal experience, um, I was working on a study where we were assessing the impacts of um, cannabis cultivation on stream flow. Um, and in this case, you know, it was a mix of legal and illegal um, cannabis cultivation operations. Um, so clearly in this case, we couldn't just publish and release the locations of um, the uh, groundwater pumping um, that we were estimating. Um, and what, you know, kind of we thought was the, the best kind of balance between um, still respecting that, that need for privacy and sharing the data was just ensuring that, you know, we publish kind of aggregated watershed scale data um, and then made it kind of very clear in the documentation and by sharing the scripts that we used to um, actually do that aggregation, made it clear how we transformed the raw data into that um, aggregated anonymized data. Um, and that would enable, you know, kind of the value that you get there is that then if someone has, you know, a data source of their own, they can number one, follow that workflow so they don't have to invent their own workflow. But number two, they can kind of aggregate to the same level and following the same procedure in case they need to do some sort of inner comparison or something like that. Um, so that's kind of what my, my reflections are on that. I'll just add quickly, I think um, there's a lot of good examples uh, in the international development community, um, the data community, uh, of combining human subjects data. So when some of the confidential information might be about humans, but also some of it may be about the kind of natural environment. Um, with, uh, there's a, there are really good examples of documenting exactly how data is slightly made slightly fuzzy, right? So often it's like rather than a point location, you get a 10 kilometer radius, let's say, in within which a village or a household is located, and also within which some natural resource might be located. Um, and so there's there's work that's been done to sort of protect humans. There's also a lot of good work that's been done about how to protect, um, you know, for example, species of, that are either endangered or imperiled in some way, or that are culturally significant and um, are protected by many of these ethical conventions, you know, global conventions. Um, in terms of, of non-disclosure. So anyway, I would point people as well to some of the, you know, some of that work that's been done um, to look at examples of documentation, I guess. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you. Those are great answers. Um, so this is uh, a question about incentivization for uh, open source data. So creating open source resources, whether that's like data sets or models, is often time consuming. Um, and we all work in a space that puts immense value on peer reviewed publications and you know how that's how we acquire funding and this, the metrics that we use. So how do we incentivize scientists, particularly us who are who feel like you know every publication is like one check one step closer to getting that uh, that academic job? How do we incentivize scientists to commit the time to uh, produce fair data? So AGU is um, working on that problem a little bit. Um, try, so they're they're encouraging journals uh, to require authors to uh, publish the data that go with um, their paper. Uh, funding agencies are required. Many funding agencies require that. Um, but, but the other piece of that, though, is to get the reward system to recognize um, that citation of data sets is equally valuable um, as citation of uh, papers. So, you know, I think there's a there's a need to change the reward system a little bit to recognize that. But, you know, there's some data sets that are just uh, downloaded and used over and over and over, and those contributions to the science are, you know, just as great or greater uh, than a paper in which the data are analyzed. So I think it's uh, a combination of things. It's getting the reward system to recognize the value and recognize citations. Uh, getting journals to continue to kind of push on this issue of publication of data as either, um, you know, a supplementary uh, a supplement to the paper or in a resource like uh, how to share where the data can be cited and downloaded. Uh, so I think, you know, it's a, a bit of a long haul, but I think the, the system is slowly moving in that direction. I'll just Sorry, oh, sorry. oh, I was just going to say, I'll add that um, I think another piece of both sides of the equation is um, being able to write into budgets the time, the, the human time and, and compensating that time appropriately that it takes to get data into a format where it can be um, deposited or shared in some way that then, you know, allows for some of these other incentive systems to validate it. Um, and I think increasingly federal funding agencies are, are quite open to that. Um, and in fact, are pushing that in some cases saying to PIs, hey, make sure you include kind of data management and data processing as a line item in your budget. Um, but I think that for all of us at whatever career stage to, to be thoughtful about that and to advocate for that in budgets at the outset, whether that's internal to a department or a university or to a funder, um, I think is another way to appropriately compensate the work it takes to get there. I would totally agree with what Jared and Crystal said um, related to the incentivization and how important that is. Um, I would also chime in that um, maybe I'm just let, have a worse memory than most people, but I find that if I'm not organizing my data and analysis um, close to the level that's necessary to release it publicly, then it's making my work more inefficient. Um, I've heard from other people that you know, you should expect on average to recreate a figure in a publication somewhere between 15 and 20 times before it's published. Um, so if you aren't um, organized and systematic in your kind of documentation um, and uh, metadata, then every time you have to recreate that figure, it's going to take more effort and more work. Um, so uh, yeah, I would say, you know, I acknowledge that there is some additional work with the step of kind of then pushing that to an online resource. Um, but I think this, the, um, the benefits of having highly organized data um, and metadata, um, in many cases, will actually um, cancel out that additional effort. I can see that with my own work. Um, it's been a little bit of a learning process for me. Um, so. Okay, so um, this one's more for using data. And this is, this is a question that everyone can answer, but directed at Crystal. So um, the USGS kind of flow and water quality data um, is, is a great example of long-term open data 
uh, that, many, that many of us hydrologists have used um, and have benefited from. However, it is hosted by governments and are vulnerable to government philosophies. And so what can we do as scientists to make sure that uh, these open data systems are robust and resilient to changing governments or shifting public interests? vote probably <laughs> which i'm sure we all do but uh i mean it's a yeah it's a great question i certainly think there are parts of the government public system that are going to be out of our control certainly for any of us early in our careers you know a few select of us might make it to a decision making role at the end of our careers um so i don't know i think there's a certain amount of just acknowledging that you know that that is a reality um i think though at a so that's sort of a like, you know, worst case scenario, things actually disappear because philosophies change. Uh, but I also think, again, this is somewhat of a social science point of view, but that is the point of view I'm bringing. Um, I do think that, that all data comes with the perspective of the, of the entity that gathered it and that presents it, right? So the amount of detail that the, the amount of processing that's been done is a technical decision, but it's also a kind of, you know, theoretical or even epistemological decision. And so I think be, being aware of that, no matter what data source we're using, right? And so that might be what was the perspective of the researcher who gathered it, if it's not a federal data source. Um, it might be what are the limitations of the geography of this data collection and how does that relate to politics? You know, are certain states in the U.S. invested in, you know, the Great Lakes, we have a, way more information about the Great Lakes than we do about some other lakes in the U.S., for example, right? And that's it's not political in a problematic way, it's just political in a, you know, it's just acknowledging that there, there are some human decision-making components to where data get gathered and how and when and how often and all of that. Um, and so to me, those, it's good to be aware of that and, and aware of when we might actually lose access or feel like data has been compromised in a way that makes it no longer usable. And that to me is the worst case scenario. I think before we get to that worst case scenario, it's just really important to reflect on always particularly if we're reusing or using secondary data, where those data are coming from and what the original um, framing of the data gathering was. Okay, so um, we have about four minutes left until one o'clock. So if the panelists, uh, we, still have, and we still have a few questions. So if you have to go, um, that's absolutely fine. Um, but and we'll just we'll just go over a little bit of time, but pop off if you need to. Uh, I know that life at home can be a little busy at times. Um, okay, so when we're working with secondary data sources, um, there are often like nuances between methodologies, um, be it you know lab procedures or field methods. Um, however, you know a lot of us when we're doing either large scale studies or we're just working with a lot of data that from multiple different sources. Um, standardizing the data can be a little bit prohibitive in terms of time and just effort. Um, so how do you, how might you guys um, approach these issues, especially in a system where we kind of publish and perish and we can't take years to be able to make sure that all the data is perfectly comparable? <laughs> I mean, methodologically? I would say there are some, you know, I think there's some interesting advances, so to speak, in you know, formal meta-analysis approaches and um, that are trying to kind of uh, be really explicit about how we might aggregate up and acknowledging that, that rarely are even two studies comparable unless they're literally done by the same person with the same protocol, let alone, you know, a breadth of many different data sources, um, but that there are some ways to both, you know, again, be explicit about that, but also still do some analysis. So I don't know, I think there's, you know, some of the, yeah, various approaches to meta-analysis and, and effect sizes and things that are moving beyond, it has to be a one-to-one, -one. this was the independent, this was the dependent variable, and we're gonna compare those relationships, but instead to say, all these different, slightly different approaches to measurements or modeling reflect the same concept in you know, the hydrological sciences. And so we're gonna, we're gonna look at the variation across those measurements, acknowledging that they are slightly different in their specifics. So I don't know, I think that's one thing potentially. Okay, um, 
All right, so I think that we probably do one more question. Um, and this is kind of a two-parter. So um, one, uh, we had a student ask, at which point in the research process is it appropriate to share our data? Um, after graduation, after manuscript submission, or after manuscript publication, or another time? And then as a second piece to that question, how do you balance uh, publishing the data kind of early with the risk of getting your ideas scooped? Um, so let's say if you're publishing the data set at the beginning of your PhD thesis that you're gonna be using all the way through, how do you avoid, or how do you balance the risk of um, getting scooped or your ideas being used somewhere else? Um, I can take a first out of this. So I guess for the first part, um, just kind of speaking personally, usually I'll have the data online in, in some form, um, kind of throughout the project through a GitHub repository or something like that, but really kind of at the point that the paper is published and I know that it's kind of the final data set that if someone is trying to recreate an exact figure, they would use that exact data set. That's the point where I'll push it somewhere very um, findable, like HydroShare or something like that. Um, to the second part, um, I may have a fringe view on this, um, but I think that there is a far greater risk of your research being ignored than your research being scooped. Um, so I personally don't uh, view that as a risk um, when I'm thinking about publishing my data. Um, again, that may be, you know, I'm very much kind of a hydrologist, somebody working in some material science or something like that, you know, the culture may be different. Um, but for most of the stuff I'm doing, you know, without really kind of uh, the knowledge of exactly how the data, the site is set up, the field site is set up and things like that, the risk of being scooped, I would say is extremely low. Um, unless it's like your lab mate or something like that, um, in which case. Hope not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, my, my view is that there's a very minimal risk of that. Yeah, and, and I, I think that, I agree. I think this risk of being scooped is overblown and maybe even perhaps an excuse um, to, you know, not do the hard work of sharing data. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, it's, you know, I, I, how many people are sitting out there waiting on you to publish the data on your watershed so that they can, you know, get a paper out before you do? I, not me. And I'll just add, I also think that um, it's important to, to think about publishing different, um, you know, different parts of data potentially at different time points. So Sam's example of like, great, the data set might be out there and some of the process might be out there on GitHub if somebody knows to look for it and chooses to look for it. But um, until you have data, code, a bunch of metadata and assumptions all in one place, it'd be pretty hard to literally scoop an analysis. Um, and this is one of the things we've talked a lot, we've thought a lot about with qualitative data, especially is that it might be more appropriate to publish kind of a higher level of processing, you know, so some description of Of a case study, let's say, rather than the actual interviews that go into a case study. Um, and maybe it's not until you're done with the analysis that you publish the more raw data, so to speak, but there are lots of ways to create metadata um, Records and, you know, sort of put out there some of the information without that very tiny risk that somebody might do something with it before you're ready for it to be done. That's fair. That's fair. Okay, so that's going to be the end of our Q&A session. Um, we, uh, of course, I'm sure this could go on forever, but we'll wrap up. So I'll pass it off to Julia Masterman. She has a few last slides from Quasi, but uh, I just want to thank all the panelists and all the attendees on behalf of um, the AGUH3S uh, team. Uh, thank you for your time and thanks for tuning in. Yeah.